Um, last week, uh, we finished looking at four elements of trumpets, and, the, and we focused on the practice of trumpets. We looked at the details of the practice, uh, the timing of the practice, the focus of the practice, and then finally, the traditions uh, of the practice. So today, I want to speak a little bit about the fulfillment of trumpets, and, and really the next prophetic event fulfilled by Jesus is trumpets. Now, remember, he fulfilled the Passover, he fulfilled unleavened bread, he fulfilled first fruits, and what's that called, by the way? All three of those together? Passover. They're called the Passover, okay? And the Passover was one feast out of three that each of the Jewish families had to, had to be there, at least the Jewish males, so it's Passover. He also fulfilled uh, Pentecost. How did he fulfill Pentecost? <laughs> Uh, so it's the Holy Spirit. So, so we've got um, we, we've got Passover, we've got Pentecost. Now we're looking at trumpets, or more specifically, tabernacles, because tabernacles includes what? Includes trumpets. What else does it include? Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur. And what else? Rosh Hashanah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that Rosh Hashanah. That's the same as trumpets. So Rosh Hashanah. Uh, Yom Kippur, and what's the and third tabernacles. one? Tabernacles. Tabernacles, or booths, okay? So, uh, and and uh, I've been preparing the lessons on booths as well. I'll tell you, there are, there is more stuff in there than I can begin to teach uh, because they are so complicated, and they become more complicated. As you look at the Talmud and take a look at the Mishka, uh, all of those things have just been added in. Uh, and it's interesting why that's happened. We'll talk about that at some point. But, but the next prophetic event is trumpets. And, and, and I say that, but why do I think Feast of Trumpets is a pro prophetic event and that, that it will be fulfilled by Christ? Why do you think I think that? Well, primarily, I think all of the spring feasts have been fulfilled and they've been pr prophetic or and, and now we're coming to the fall feasts. And I'm anticipating that they will also be fulfilled by Christ. And, and, and I think one day we're gonna be interrupted with a very loud sound. And that sound will be a very loud trumpet blast. And the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible. Well, why do I say that? How do I know that? The Bible clearly tells me that. All right, Jack, can you read 1 Corinthians 15, 52? Yes, that's mid-sentence, so I'm going to pick it up with 51. Listen, okay. I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. Now, it's interesting that right before this class, Alvin and I were talking, and he was telling me he was praying. Can you share that, Alvin? We prayed for Suzanne and also for Samuel. And God would heal them of Von Wilbrandt's disease. I said, God, you tell us that you're going to change us all in, the, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. I said, so this really is not much of a problem. <laughs> and I said, please, Lord, for their good and for your glory, please heal them. And all God's people said, Amen. not for that, Alvin. So, but, 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 but God says in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. So today I want to cover the details of what the fulfillment will be, how the fulfillment will happen, and why I believe it's accurate. Now, I'm telling you what I believe based on what I've read, that doesn't mean it's going to absolutely happen that way. Does that make sense? Okay. And there are other people who think it's going to happen different ways. Um, and so what the fulfillment will be, how the fulfillment will happen, and why I believe it's accurate, to some extent, are my opinions. Okay. <laughs> right. And people who think differently, you know, that, I mean, there are lots, there's a lot of diverse opinions within the body of Christ. <laughs> Uh, so what I'm going to share with you is what I'm persuaded. Paul used to say, I am persuaded. And based on my study, this is what I'm pers persuaded it means. So, so what will the fulfillment be? And simply stated, fulfillment will be the delivery on the obvious 
as well as hidden promises made by God. Okay? Let me read it again. Fulfillment will be the delivery on both the obvious as well as the hidden promises made by God. Now, let me give you some examples, a few brief examples. I don't want to go into too many of them, but after the fact, it is now much easier, would you agree, to see how Jesus fulfilled the Passover feast? Okay, you can see it. Now, at the time, it wasn't so obvious. And while the Passover promises were fulfilled by the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and it was the death, the burial, the resurrection as an atonement for our sins, okay? And, and I'm, yes, I'm going to use that, that negative word sin in class here today. So if any of you are offended by that, uh, I apologize. It was really interesting. Uh, how many of you ever watch, uh, know who Lawrence Jones is? Uh, Lawrence Jones is an African-American newscaster on Fox News, okay? Lawrence Jones said this morning, okay, now for those of you who don't listen to Fox News, I'm sorry, but anyway, <laughs> Lawrence Jones said this morning, he said, we are called to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. He said, now, he said, he said I am not holier than thou. I make lots of mistakes, and I've been saved by God's grace. Okay, now this is Lawrence Jones on national TV. And then he said, and we are called also to share the message of liberty because liberty and faith are related. Huh? Pretty good, huh? And he said, I am now a libertarian. They were asking why he's liberty. He said, I am a libertarian because the Republican Party has moved away from core values in the gospel. And once they come back, he said, I'll come home. Isn't that great? Preach it, Lawrence. He's, yeah, he may not have his job tomorrow, but 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 you never know. Uh, so so anyway, so I was listening to Lawrence. I'm thinking, yeah, you preach. Come on, give me some more. Uh, but I think people are are really scrambling and dying to hear the real truth. Okay. So now, after the fact, it's much easier. And the Passover prophecies have been fulfilled by the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then the endowment of us with the Holy Spirit. So Jesus even told his disciples beforehand. He told us, and he told them more than once. He told them multiple times that this is going to happen. And guess what? Where did they find, where, where were the disciples after the crucifixion? They were hiding in an upper room and brooding because they thought that he was going to be the Messiah. But they were looking for, they were looking for a military Messiah who was going to conquer Rome. And he did conquer Rome, but he conquered Rome with the gospel. Okay, so, so essentially, uh, Jesus told his disciples before, and they missed it. They missed it. And yet, later on, John, the one closest to him, the one he loved, John called him the Lamb of God. And all of the apostles, save one, were willing to die. And they all were killed because of their faith. Okay? And, and why did that happen? Why? Gary Habermas is a good friend of mine. And he is the form, one of the foremost experts in the United States, if not one of the foremost experts in the world on the resurrection. And Gary said, that is a primary case and bit of evidence that indicates that Jesus rose from the dead. Why else would they have such a dramatic change in such a short period of time had they not seen something supernatural? And they saw the supernatural resurrection of Jesus Christ. And guess what? We're going to see it someday too. Yeah. See, so, so essentially, um, this is what John called him. And, and, and now with tabernacles, we'll see something similarly amazing. And it, too, will deliver on the promises made, fulfilling the Old Testament and the New Testament prophecies. And the real bonus will be that the Jews will see the Messiah, the deliverer, the warrior they first expected. Okay? They expect, see, they expected a warrior to come. And, and when Jesus came the first time, he was well capable of being a warrior. What did he tell Peter in the garden? When he cut off somebody, he said, cut off Malchus' ear. What did, what did he tell Peter? 
Don't you think I could call? <laughs> don't you call a legion of angels? Okay. He said, that's not what this is about. So Peter was confused and distressed. But Jesus didn't come the first time as a warrior. He's coming the second time as a warrior. So I want to begin here with something obvious. We're going to talk about what the fulfillment will be, how the fulfillment will happen, and why I believe it's accurate. So I want to start with something obvious. And I'll elaborate on that in, in the next section. But uh, Jack, can you read 1 Thessalonians 4, 14 through 17? We believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Now we know that Paul was also taken up to the third heaven. It's in 2 Corinthians 12. And he saw God's plans, okay? And, and God revealed those plans directly to Paul. And so he shares those plans with us. And he tells us, that Jesus will come with God's trumpet call, after which he promises, and I'll read it again, we who are still alive and are left shall be caught up together, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord temporarily. Forever, okay? It's almost as if, do you ever think of it? It's almost as if, here, Paul's watching or recalling a movie or something that he saw, okay? And, and, and he's, he's telling us. And, and, and the Greek here shall be caught up. The Greek word is harpazo. And it appears 14 times in the New Testament. And, and, and the definition of it is to, something to occur suddenly with violence or speed, swooping quickly without warning. What does that say to you? <laughs> Huh? Sudden, uh, quick. What, 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 did, what did Alvin say earlier in, in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye? In eschatological terms, harpazo refers to what's known as what? The rapture. The rapture. Now, hold on a minute, because I'm going to go through that. Where did the word rapture come from? Because it's not even in the Bible. Okay. The Latin Vulgate. Yeah, it, 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 the Latin is raptura or rapio. That's the, that's the base word, which means to seize or to snatch. Well, why is Latin of any significance? Latin was the primary language, and it lasted in some form from 200 B.C. until the 1800s. <laughs> And there, and there were a variety of versions of it uh, spoken at the time. There was Old Latin, there was Classical Latin, there was Vulgar Latin. Isn't that interesting? Vulgar Latin. I sometimes speak vulgar English, but Vulgar Latin, <laughs> Medieval Latin, Renaissance Latin, New Latin, Contemporary Latin. And, and, and because the communication was primarily in Latin, Jerome decided to translate the Bible into Latin. Okay, before that, it wasn't wasn't in Latin, but Jerome translated, and it's called, go ahead, Mari, the Latin, the Latin Vulgate, okay? And harpazo is really a form of raptura. And most people now call the Vulgate, uh, and most people read the Vulgate um, before the Reformation. So the Reformation occurred in, in 1517, but most people read the Vulgate now. Here's something else that's really important. John Darby, D-A-R-B-Y, was a popular Bible teacher. And he was from Ireland. Did you know that he was from Ireland? Okay, and, and he preached in the 19th century, the 1800s. And, and, and many rapture critics or people who disagree with the rapture argue that that all started with Darby. 
and the Schofield Bible. And he popularized the pre-tribulation rapture. But I tell you that the concept existed well before that. As a matter of fact, people grappled with Thessalonians for centuries. Origen, Augustine, Chrysostom, all of them grappled with this idea of rapture. So the rapture's been around for a while. Mario, you want to add anything to that? No, but I have this many documents that it was, and it went all the way back to the early church. And yeah. for me, I don't care about what anyone else wrote or John Nelson Darby. I go back to this. Mm -hmm. And the early church was pre-tribulational, pre-millennial, and there is no doubt about it for the first century. But then the, uh, the Alexandria School of, of allegorizing and so forth came in, and that's when everything started to morph and change. See, Mari's a real Bible scholar in this class. Right? But, but you're, you're absolutely correct. Well, what I want to do is show you a fulfillment of a pros prophecy that's a little bit hidden, okay? And, and I read this in three or four separate commentaries. I didn't know this. I hadn't even thought about that, and I'd never seen it before. But there's a verse I want to review briefly, and it reveals something that's hidden. Now, Jack, can you read Leviticus 23, verse 22? When you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Leave them for the poor and the alien. I am the Lord, your God. Now think about that poor and alien. And I believe this is a verse about the fulfillment of something that would happen in the future. The last of the spring feasts is Pentecost. And up to this point, Moses, who is the writer of Leviticus, goes from the Passover to unleavened bread to first fruits to Pentecost. But there's a gap in here. And it ends in verse 21. Verse 21 is the last verse about the Pente about Pentecost. And by the way, uh, this year Pentecost was May 23rd in 2021. But trumpets begins in verse 23. Well, my question is, why not just go on to trumpets following the pattern in verse 22? Why the interruption here? Well, in verse 22, God tells them to remember the poor, the aliens, or strangers. Why? Well, it's obvious, and, and, and it's true, that that's a good thing to do, okay? But this chapter, if you think about this chapter as prophetic, we have to ask, is there another meaning here? Was God showing us what he do between the fulfillment of Pentecost and the fulfillment of trumpets. And again, I believe he was pointing ahead. And there's a three-month gap in the calendar. There's a three-month gap between Pentecost and trumpets. Now think of the poor, the alien, the strangers. They're to be fed by the same provision God made for the Jews. The poor, the alien, the strangers. If you're a Jew, what, you, what would you think the poor, the alien, the strangers? Is there a group that you would identify? The Gentiles, okay? And I believe it gap points to the, to the church age. During this period, God remembered the poor, the alien, the strangers, the Gentiles. And there's a gap between the fulfillment of Pentecost and the fulfillment of trumpets. So after he came down... He saw, Moses saw the golden calf, and he had been up in the mountain with the Lord. The Lord had given the, temp the, 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 the templates, and what did he do with the templates? He broke them. He threw them. He was mad. He was ticked off, okay? And he told the Levites to do what? What do you tell the Levites? Go ahead, Jerry. Grind them up and then drink them. Yeah, yeah. Go kill the offenders. Kill the offenders. Now, in Exodus 32, how many people were killed? Exodus 32, how many people were killed that day? How, how many? All right, 3,000 people were killed that day. But that wasn't God's ultimate intention. God wants to give us life. He wants to give people life. 2 Corinthians 3, 4, and 6, Jack. 
Such confidence as this is ours through Christ before God. Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Now, let's go back to he has made us competent, okay? Tell me about the Apostle Paul. Or I, I'm sorry, not Paul, Peter. Tell me about Peter, the Apostle. What do you know about Peter? Well, he went from fisherman to scholar. Well, he, he, so he grew up a fisherman, right? Yeah. Now, what does that mean? Is he well-educated in law? He was a rough, tough guy, okay? He wasn't sophisticated. He wasn't educated. And yet, the Pharisees were amazed. Why? When he spoke. Yeah. So who gave him that confidence? Jesus Christ. So this is exactly what he's saying in 2 Corinthians, okay? That the Lord made him competent, and he said, the law kills, or the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. At Pentecost, now 3,000 were killed, Okay. What happened at Pentecost? Peter preached. 3,000 were saved. And that began the church age. The law kills, but the Spirit gives life. And Peter was endowed with the Holy Spirit, as were the rest of the apostles. The law kills, but the Spirit gives life. You see, the, the, the church age is an age of grace to the Gentiles, to you and me. And it continues until that heavenly trumpet sounds, when the church age is done. And then I believe, some would disagree with this, but then I believe we'll be raptured and God will turn his attention to the Jews. And that's coming soon. And it's not gonna be pleasant for the Jews. By the way, hiding in the mystery here, hiding in mystery here is not unlike God, is it? Okay, he's got lots of mysteries that we haven't begun to figure out. So, so what the fulfillment will be is easy to explain. It's God delivering on the remaining promises. Now, I want to look for a minute at how trumpets and, to some extent, the other fall feasts will be fulfilled. But I'm going to focus primarily on trumpets. And I want to cover this briefly today. I'll be more in depth in, in, in subsequent weeks. But first, we know that it's going to happen. At least something's going to happen. Throughout the Bible, we find it, not just in the New Testament, but also in the Old Testament. Jack, can you read Isaiah 27, 13? And in that day, a great trumpet will sound. Those who were perishing in Assyria and were exiled in Egypt will come and worship the Lord on the holy mountain in Jerusalem. Now, other explanations exist, and I've read many of those, but to me, they don't seem to make as much sense as a literal interpretation. Now, I know Israel was regathered, and some believe that this regathering is a fulfillment of that prophecy, and there's some truth here. But others say it, it's fulfilled in the reacquiring of Jerusalem. Tough to say, but why do I call it, by the way, their land? Their land. Why do I call it their land? Okay. God returned them to their land. Yeah. Bart covered this in a series, but God gave them the land. Jack, real quickly, Exodus 23, 31. I will establish your borders from the Red Sea to the Sea of the Philistines and from the desert to the river. I will hand over to you the people who live in the land and you will drive them out before you. All right, so th there is also more detail about that in Genesis 15, but from a worldly perspective, how is it received that Israel will have their own land? From a worldly perspective, yeah. How, how is it that Israel will have their own land? Not, not well received, is it? Yet biblically, the promise is clear. And it marks prophetic fulfillment of that promise. But that's not all. That's not the only thing. The 10 days between trumpets and tabernacles is called the days of awe. And, and, and there are 10 days of awe that are prominent 
in the Jewish culture, in the Jewish tradition, in the Jewish religion. Uh, so the days of all are important. And the most solemn and holy of all feasts is really, it's the focus on repentance and redemption. And, and the feast lasts, by the way, the, the, the Rosh Hashanah uh, lasts for how many days? Oh, two. Two days. Why is that two? Why two days? Okay, and it had to be verified by whom? By what? Uh, well, it was announced by the chief priest, but it was verified by whom? Remember, two witnesses. And why two witnesses? See, the two witnesses would observe it and then report it to the high priest. The two witnesses had to agree that they had seen the new moon and then they report to the high priest. So why do we have two days instead of one day of Rosh Hashanah? So what? So the word can be verified throughout the whole land. So word could be verified throughout the whole land and it would have taken time and they did want to miss the opportunity for Rosh Hashanah. Now, all over scripture in the Old Testament and New Testament, you need two witnesses. Deuteronomy 9.15, Jack, and then Matthew 18.16. So it's in both the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. Deuteronomy 19.15. Yeah. One witness is not enough to convict a man accused of any crime or offense he may have committed. A matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Matthew 8.16. When evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him, and he drove out the spirits with a word and healed all the sick. But so, so though Israel's return to land now, now, by the way, that's, that's just two verses of 34 that I found saying that you need two witnesses. Okay. So that's all over scripture, but even though Israel's return to the land is an important promise of trumpets, and it's a promise fulfilled by God. That, that whole return was miraculous. And at the same time, it's not likely that that alone fulfills Rosh Hashanah and the promise of Rosh Hashanah. So, so what is that fulfillment? fulfillment? Well, I believe it's the rapture. The believers promised resurrection. And support for that's found again in 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 23. Gary Heberman has, uh, has said and told me, and, and he has, of course, spoken to our class, and we'll have him back sometime in the future. But he has told me that the primary, primary chapter, the primary book, the primary chapter on the resurrection is 1 Corinthians 15. Okay. So, Jack, can you read 1 Corinthians 15, verses 20 through 23? Yes, and uh, with regard to the last ver verse in Matthew, that was Matthew 18, 16, that calls for two witnesses. That's why it was not um, uh, quite right. But here we go with 1 Corinthians 15, 20. Uh, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. All right, stop right there, Jack. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. What does he mean by that? Christ has been raised to dead, from the dead, the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. What does he mean by fallen asleep? Those who have died. Okay. Well, what does he mean when he tells us that Christ is the first fruits? He's the first one to be raised from the dead. But what does that imply? Yeah, there'll be there'll be a lot more. Just like the first fruits feast, where the the first fruits were brought to the temple as an offering, okay? But it was a, a, an offering that indicated that many more would come. Same thing here, okay? So go ahead, continue, Jack. Verse 21, for since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive, but each in his own turn. Christ, the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. All right, so I believe, I believe that this indicates, again, another verse that indicates the rapture, and you've got 1 Thessalonians 4 that we've already read. And by the way, I've also read 
and this is the first time I've actually seen this, that the days of awe actually symbolize the seven-year tribulation. Oh, well, now, wait a minute. There are 10 days of awe. How does this symbolize the, the, the tribulation? Well, let me, let me show you real quickly. And this, again, is in honor of Bart because i got a nice chart here. As a matter of fact, when I showed him this, he, he cheered. Um, <laughs> but if you take a look at the, the, the rapture, is really the end of the church age, okay? The, the church age is over at this point. And as I said before, God is going from dealing with the church to dealing with whom? Yeah, you know, the Jews, okay? Uh, and, and it's a bit more obscure, but the 10 days seem to be broken down into three periods, okay? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna use the pointer today. Uh, uh, but, but if you take a look at this, this first period is Tishri. And first and second Tishri, that's when the celebration of Rosh Hashanah occur. Now, right here at the end, okay, you've got Yom Kippur, okay, on day 10. And there are seven then days of repentance and prayer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, uh, in between. So what we're saying is uh, the rapture of the church goes here. You've got oppression, persecution, repentance of Israel, uh, and and that progression, by the way, is going to get worse and worse. You know, the, uh, uh, the Antichrist will make a deal uh, with Israel. I don't know how it's going to happen, but he will allow them to rebuild the temple. Okay, and they can rebuild the temple pretty quickly. They already have all of the things they need for inside the temple. But then he will, he will violate that by actually entering the temple. Why is that a problem? Huh? Who were the only ones able to enter the temple? Yeah. Well, actually, priests, Levites could enter the temple. The high priest could only enter the Holy of Holies, and that was only once per year. That's exactly right. He'll enter the temple, and he will sit there and declare himself to be God. Well, what do you think is going to happen when he does that? How do you think the Jews are going to respond to that? Huh? They're not going to like it. Uh, they're going to rebel. They're going to yell. They're going to scream. And what's the effect of that going to be? After them. The Antichrist will be angered, and he will go after the Jews. And he will slaughter them and kill them. And they'll call him righteous for doing that. And uh, what percentage of the Jews will be killed? You know, you're talking about a bloodbath here. You're talking about two-thirds of the, of the Jews are going to be killed. Now, one-third of them will be hidden by God, and we're going to talk about that later on. But two-thirds of them will be killed by the Antichrist. Okay? Now, that's pretty serious stuff. But if you take a look at the first two days of Rosh Hashanah, now, now, now advocates argue that the next seven days, again, are that intense period that I talked about. And they say Daniel's 70th week will be fulfilled in that seven-year tribulation, and that's symbolized by the days of awe. Now, it ends with Yom Kippur, the third element that prophesies Israel's true repentance, okay? So at, at some point, the Zechariah 12 verse that says, what does it say? They will look on him who they've pierced, and they will do what? They will mourn. And that word for mourn is also the word for repentance. They will repent. They will mourn. They will be sad. All of that stuff. Okay, so, so essentially, the biblical evidence is pretty good for this, but it, it may or may not be the seven years. I think it is. And it's certainly plausible because of other occurrences around it. Yom Kippur, for example. It points to the true repentance I talked about. And the last feast of, uh, of, uh, of this whole fall feast era is what? The tabernacles. And tabernacles signifies the thousand-year reign of Christ. Now, again, there are plenty of people who disagree with that, but I am convinced as I study that that's the way it is. Now, the Day of Atonement also includes and fulfills something else. Remember what Paul said, okay? And this is why I say this. I want, I want, I want to give you evidence of, of why I'm persuaded it's this way. Jack, can you read uh, Romans 11, verses 25 through 27? 
I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brother. Right, hold on just a second, Jack. Who is Paul speaking to here? He's speaking to Gent primarily because Paul was the apostle to whom? Gentile. The Gentiles. So he's speaking primarily to Gentile believers. All right, Jack, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved as it is written, quote, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. So he will take godliness, godlessness away from Jacob. Now, what does he tell them? What, what is he worried about them being? What do you, what do you say? Yeah, he's worried about them being conceited, okay? He doesn't want them because he, and, and it, I looked up conceited, and it says having or showing an excessively high opinion of oneself. It's kind of like what Anthony Fauci recently said. You know, <laughs> if you disagree with me, you disagree with science, right? Uh, do you think that's a little bit conceited and arrogant? Okay, so so essentially, uh, some of some of the Gentile believers. There was a certain amount of conceit that existed among them. And the conceit was that we're in and you're out. And evidently there had been some discussions. And Paul jumps on this really early and he jumps on it quickly to refute this notion right from the start. He says this in Romans 11, 1, 2. Jack, can you read that? I ask then, did God reject his people? By no means. I am an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. God did not reject his people whom he foreknew. Don't you know that the scriptures say that the scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he appealed to God against Israel? Then he tells us that Israel experienced a partial hardening to allow the Gentiles to enter in. In other words, once Israel had rejected Christ, he hardened their hearts, okay? And at least some of them, not all of them, some of them. Remember what it says in John 1, 1 11? He came to his own, but his own received him not. But then it goes on to say, but all who received him. Okay, so essentially this brought the development and the growth of the church, okay? This is the church age. This is part of the church age, and it's currently being fulfilled. And, and the hardening was for a portion of Jews because, and there is an increasing number, by the way, of Messianic Jews who are believers in Christ. As a matter of fact, Aaron Bortz, you remember Aaron Bortz? I brought Aaron to class one time, and he talked about the Seder. Well, Aaron is actually uh, the rabbi for a Messianic Jewish congregation. They meet over near Bartstown. As a matter of fact, Gigi and I are going to go over there. Uh, one day, they, they, and they meet at Saturday, uh, so I just have to remember it's Saturday, not Sunday. But, but still, the body, the nation, and especially Jewish rulers, I mean, Jewish right now, Israel right now is pretty secular. Although there is a moving of the spirit in Israel, and I was listening to a, to a Messianic uh, Jewish rabbi preaching from Israel, talking about the moving of the spirit in Israel, and people are looking for truth and substance, and people are being converted. But still, the body of the nation is secular and against Christ, okay? And we believe that this will continue until the church age has been completed. And by the way, what did Jesus say about building his church? Jack, can you read Matthew 16, 18? And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. So Christ promised that he was going to build his church, okay, on Peter. Now, there are a number of different interpretations of that, but essentially he was going to use Peter in a powerful way, okay? And by the way, Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. What was Peter? Apostle to the Jews, okay? So he was going to build his church on that. Now, Acts 2 and Acts 9 indicate that Peter actually began to fulfill that promise as he built the church. 
as he began to build, 3,000 were converted at Pentecost, and he continued to do his work. And ultimately, he was killed for that work, and he was killed for his faith, and how did he die? Crucified. crucified what way? Upside down. upside down. Crucified upside down. See, but once the fulfillment of the Gentiles has been completed, the church age will be over, and that will be totally fulfilled. And then God turns his attention back to the Jews, back to Israel, and back to the promises he made to them. And by, by the way, the Jews already believed in the resurrection, didn't they? Jack, can you read Ezekiel uh, 37, verses 12 through 14? Therefore, prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. O oh, my people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and I have done it, declares the Lord. And, and you know, some sects of the Jews actually believed that it was going to occur, that would occur on trumpets, which is interesting. But the blast, whenever it occurs, will be the powerful sound that's said to awaken those who have died. And it raises them to life. And Isaiah speaks also of the resurrection of the dead. Isaiah 26, 19, Jack. But your dead will live, their bodies will rise. You who dwell in the dust, wake up and shout for joy. Your dew is like the dew of the morning. The earth will give birth to her dead. What I love about this is that you can find promises in the Old Testament that are even that are either fulfilled or repeated in the New Testament. And the New Testament version of this is 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 52. Jack, can you read that again? Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. So, it, so it's emphasized in many places. And it was known in ancient Israel as the great trumpet occurring on the Feast of Trumpets. Now remember, how many trumpet blasts are there on the Feast of Trumpets? Do you remember? A bunch. Seven. There, there are a hundred. A hundred trumpet blasts. And, and the last trumpet blast is called the last trump. So, so can, take it any way you want to, but for me, that's further proof that the rapture and the resurrection are tied directly to trumpets. Now, now some believe this Rosh Hashanah trumpet is the same one in Revelation 11, 14, 15. Can you read that, Jack? The second woe has passed. The third woe is coming soon. The seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven which said, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. Now, the trumpet that Paul is speaking of here is the last trumpet of the seventh angel, okay? And, and that one brings what? Brings the, it's right before the third woe, okay? Mm -hmm. And that's during the tribulation. Or as the Old Testament says, what's the tribulation called? Time of Jacob's, Time of Jacob's trouble. And that's completely different than the trumpets in Corinthians and Thessalonians because that's... That, that brings life, and the Revelation trumpet brings death and destruction. So there, go ahead, Mari. And also, John obviously had written Revelation when Paul wrote about the last trumpet. So he wasn't talking about a, tr tr a judgment, yeah. judgment trumpet. He was talking about a that's judgment. Exactly, for, that's exactly right. And to make those fit, some people have said, well, John and Revelation were written earlier. But they were about 95 uh, uh, A.D. is when they were written. But, but last week I said that Jewish practice of the feast is also associated with something else. It's associated with the coronation of a king. And that's very interesting. And the fulfillment of, found, of that is found in, in whom? In Jesus, Jesus Christ, the king who's coming back to rule in righteousness. Now, the Jews don't believe that that's about Jesus. 
But I, I absolutely believe that this coronation occurs during trumpets and Yom Kippur and tabernacles or the whole tabernacles feast. And remember, these three feasts combined are called tabernacles. And, and, and at the coronations, okay, they would blow trumpets and proclaim the king. You remember when Solomon was proclaimed king. Uh, First Kings 1, 39, 40, Jack. Zadok, the priest, took the horn of oil from the sacred tent and anointed Solomon. Then they sounded the trumpet and all the people shouted, Long live King Solomon! And all the people went up after him, playing flutes and rejoicing greatly so that the ground shook with the sound. Okay, now tell me the politics behind Solomon being appointed king. What were the politics here? He wasn't the son that was in line to be king. He was the son, but, um, and then the son that was in line to be king tried to take over and be the king, and he wound up having to be killed. Or, yeah, I think it's Azariah, or Isaiah, that's his name, this, this other son, and he had already declared himself the king, and the people were marching after him, and so someone came in, to, I think it was to Bathsheba, and she went into David, and he's on his deathbed, and he says, all right, quick, go get my mule, put Solomon on it, and take him out, call him along with the king, and that's how they overcame him. Yeah, and, 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 and they had gathered their homies, and they were, they, were, they, were, they were away, and they had begun to declare him king, and that's when Solomon was declared king. So uh, what we believe is that, uh, go ahead, Alvin. The son that had declared himself king was the surviving eldest son. There had been four sons that died before that. And so he was the survivor then, which left him as the eldest son. But Nathan the prophet had said earlier, in fact, God had promised uh, David that a son will be born to you, whose name is Solomon, and he will be the one who builds the temple. And so, Nathan went to Bathsheba and said, you go in and tell David what's going on because he doesn't know. And he says, I'll come in right after you. And so he came in right after I know him. it was a little deal. There, there are all kinds of politics there. It's really fun to watch. It reminds me of growing up a Democrat in Chicago. But, <laughs> but, 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 but essentially that's exactly what happened. And, and I, I absolutely believe that sometime during t Tabernacles, Jesus will be proclaimed king of the world. Now, he doesn't have to be proclaimed. He could just be king of the world. But I believe he'll be proclaimed. And, and I read that actually the breaking of each seal depicts Jesus the king taking back his kingdom. And remember, in Revelation 19, John sees a vision of Jesus. And that vision is of Jesus riding on a white horse with eyes like blazing fire. And, and, and I, I was looking for depictions of this. I can't really find uh, too many, but he's dressed in a white robe. Remember that in Revelation? He's dressed in a white robe, and a white robe is dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. And he's returning with power and righteousness and justice. And John tells us that in Revelation 19, 14 to 16. Can you read that? The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. Quote, he will rule them with an iron scepter, end quote. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Amen. Now, he's going to come back, and he's going to reign in justice and righteousness for a thousand years. How, where do I get the thousand years? Revelation 24 through 6. Jack, can you read that? I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge, and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony for Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who have part in the first resurrection. 
the second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. Now, if you want to go look at signs again, remember, uh, you find the signs of the times in Matthew 24. And, and I believe we're moving closer and closer and closer to that day. So the question is, what are we saying here? I remember my, my son uh, wrote a song um, called The Warrior. Okay, and he sang that song and he was chastised for that. He received all kinds of criticism online of people saying, my God does not destroy people. My God is not going to be a vengeful God. And he got a lot of criticism for that. But let me tell you, if you read God's word, it tells you that Jesus is going to come back, not as a gentle servant, but as a warrior. And, and so what are we saying here? And how does fulfillment of these prophetic feasts happen? I think it trumpets, in my opinion, and I think scripture supports that. We, the believers, will be raised to meet Jesus in the air. In 1 Thessalonians 4, it says that. And during the next seven days or years, God will execute his judgment on the earth, called the tribulation. And Rosh Hashanah and the days of awe and Yom Kippur will all be fulfilled because at the end of that persecution, that persecution is going to drive the Jews to a point of everything being hopeless. And then it says they will look on him who they pierce. Now, in subsequent lessons, I'll talk to you about what I think is going to happen. So, so how do the days of all work with prophecy? Again, I said the rapture occurs first. But nowhere does it say that the tribulation occurs immediately post-rapture. There is first Rosh Hashanah for two days. Now, if they're saying that every day is a year, that's two years. And then two days of Rosh Hashanah, actually, what I said, two years in the seven days before Yom Kippur, the tribulation. Well, what if it's true? Let's take a look at what that might mean. And again, nowhere... Does it say that the tribulation immediately follows the rapture? And the short gap makes sense because they're going to have to recover from a lot of stuff. Let's, let's talk about this for a minute. Latest stats shows that there were about 2.4 billion people in the world who claim Christianity. Now, that said, let's, let's assume that only about 20% actually are true believers. Okay, you're talking about 480 million people who are true Christians. 480 million. Now, during COVID, we lost 4 million. And what happened across the world, across the globe? People went nuts. They panicked. They went crazy. And then the press didn't help many. Can you imagine the chaos? It will create when 480 million people are missing. Huh? And, and the seven years is well documented in the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's in Daniel 7. It's in Daniel 9. It's in Matthew 24. It's in Revelation 11. So the next seven days represent, I believe, the seven years of tribulation, ending with Yom Kippur. And Yom Kippur is Israel's true repentance and God's grace as they look on Christ. And then Jesus defeats his enemies. He reigns for a thousand years and all he promised in his word will be fulfilled. Now, we've covered the reasons why Jews celebrate two days of Rosh Hashanah. But like Paul Harvey, remember how Paul Harvey used to say? The rest of the story. And, and the Jews, there is a rest of the story here. The Jews call this Yom Hakish. The hidden day is supposed to be a time that's hidden from Satan. And no one knew exact day of trumpets. They didn't know when it would occur. And you heard Doug explain that that's an idiom. 
and Jesus using that would have led them to believe that it occurs during trumpets. Now, if you look at Matthew 24, starting in verse 32, you see Jesus giving the analogy of the fig tree. Matthew 24, 36, Jack, can you read that? No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Now, Christians have typically interpreted this to mean no one knows the end, the time, the end. So, so, so don't bother trying to figure it out. Just be prepared always. And that's true. However, Jews in Jesus' time would have associated this with the Feast of Trumpets. And it, it's interesting that there's a concept that believers are hidden at this time. Colossians 3.3, 3, Jack. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Now, there are several verses like Psalm 27. And, and, and Psalm 27 is read every day during that 40-day period. When I say 40-day period, I'm talking about from the first of Elul. Remember, I told you they actually start the repentance then uh, to Yom Kippur. So that's 40 days. And, and Psalm 27.5 is, is really telling us that God will hide us in the days of his wrath. Jack, can you read that real quickly? For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his tabernacle and set me high upon a rock. Now, how's he going to do that? By bringing us up to heaven through the rapture and away from the earth and away from his wrath. And again, Isaiah 26 is even more explicit about that. And John looks and sees an open door and hears a trumpet and he's called up to heaven in Revelation 4, 1 through 3. Can you read that real quickly, Jack? After this, I looked and there before me was a door standing open in heaven and the voice I had he first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it, and the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian, a rainbow resembling an emerald encircled the throne. So John is called up. He's immediately before the throne, and it's interesting that all of this occurs before God begins to pour out his wrath. Why do I say that? Well, the, the timing seems to make sense. For, because John is called up, God comes to get us, and the church age closes, and the bride of Christ, the church, is taken up to heaven, and the promise of trumpets is fulfilled. Now, there are seven reasons why I believe this is true. And I'll get through as many of them as I can in like about a minute or two. All right. So first, while the rapture in the New Testament doctrine and it's a New Testament doctrine, Old Testament events foreshadow it. And God all, often delivers his people to safety before he executes judgment. Think about this. Think about what he did for Enoch. Enoch was taken up before the flood. Noah and his family. Noah and his family were saved before the flood. Lot and his family. They were saved before Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed. And there are many more. But the point is that this pattern is that God regularly saves his people from a wrath. As a matter of fact, 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 tells us that he hasn't appointed us to wrath. Secondly, we're promised that Jesus will save us from God's wrath. 1 Thessalonians 1, 10, real quickly, Jack. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. See, also we're told that God has not appointed us to wrath, as I said earlier. Uh, he has appointed us to salvation, and that saved us from his wrath. Thirdly, Jesus affirms the same thing in Revelation 3.10, which is also why I believe in the pre-tribulation rapture. Fourth, and the, the verse, we're not going to go there, but the verse is Revelation 3.10. Fourth, John seems to put the rapture, come up here, before the tribulation in Revelation 4. Now. From that point on, from, from Revelation, let's say, 6 through chapter 19, there is no discussion about the church. The church isn't mentioned once. It's absent. Okay? Fifth, Jesus promises to return and remove his people from earth in John 14. Sixth, 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul reaffirms Jesus' promise. Seventh, 
God has made promises about all of this. And I absolutely believe he will deliver on them. Now, there's so much more about this. But next week, we're going to begin Yom Kippur, and I will float back and forth between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Okay, and all God's people said. Amen. Bart, can you close us in prayer? Thank you.